All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of The Big Questions with Big John. And today I have a guest. We had a little bit of trouble getting them scheduled because, and it's all on me. You know, I'm, I'm willing to step up and say it's all on me. I had all a bunch of issues and and this and this dude was so uh, understanding and so kind. So I want to thank him up front for putting up with a lot of rescheduling. Uh, he really put up with a lot, but I'm glad he's here. I really wanted to talk to him. He's got a very interesting bio and I want to share that with all of you out there today. So let me introduce him. My guest today is Antonio T. Smith Jr. And yes. let, me, let me glance a little bit over here, Antonio, so I can I can look at this. Your bio says Antonio T. Smith Jr. is an internationally recognized trainer and speaker. He's also a best-selling author in self-help and religious categories and the CEO of ATS Jr. Companies. Not junior companies, as in small companies, but the name of the company is ATS Junior. So I, I just don't want people to think you're dealing with small companies there somehow. Uh, Mr. Smith claims to have begun giving away one and a half billion, that's with a B, billion dollars, and plans to be finished with that task of philanthropy by 2025. So that's ambitious. I want to talk to him about that. I'm sure we're all interested. So everyone, welcome to Mr. Smith, Antonio T. Smith Jr. Welcome, Antonio. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I've been binge listening to at least six episodes of your podcast. Um, I um, love it. Oh, man. Thank you so much for saying that. And by the yeah. way, I have to I have to admit to something. Being a sports guy, an old sports journalist, I come this close every time I read your name and say your name to saying Antonio T. Gibson, the running back, the Washington <laughs> Commanders. And I have to, and I don't know why Antonio's not that rare a name, especially if you're Greek or Italian, like I am, you know, you hear it all the time, Antonio, Anthony, uh, you know, yeah. and it's like, I don't know why I confuse the two of you, but you know, and I'll take his money. He, he can give me his money. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, I'll take it too. You're right. <laughs> all right. So Antonio, uh, I was reading through your bio. You've got like one of these great stories. Um, it's very inspirational and certainly someone who I, I, and I hope I'm not overstating anything. Someone who's worked for everything he's got, like nothing was really handed to you on a silver platter. You're someone I consider to be entrepreneurial, if not in the traditional sense, you know, of like, hey, I, I went to B2B school and, you know, and this and that. But, you know, you're certainly someone who works for what he's got and someone who uh, obviously is a spiritual person um, and, and, and someone who uh, I like. I always love your type of story, to be honest with you. It's very inspirational to me. It's inspirational to others. I'm, I've never been one to sit back and say the world owes me. You know, yeah. the world owes me some supernatural being owes me or owes me <laughs> right. or this, that I'm not that type of personality. I get the feeling you're not either. So yeah. Antonio, why don't you give us a little bit of your origin story? Let's pretend you're a superhero right now. Give yeah, us your origin sure. story, man. Yeah, sure. Born 1981, 1985, crack cocaine comes through the urban neighborhoods. So my mom and my dad both got addicted to crack cocaine. So by the time I'm five years old, they can't keep me, can't legally keep me, can't morally keep me, can't even in mind space keep me. They're both addicted to drugs. To this day, my mom is still addicted to the drugs. So what is that? 40 years or something like that. 35, oh 40 years. And my father is in prison right now on, on a 55 year sentence. He's done 30 years of that 55 year sentence. So I literally was homeless from five to 15. I failed the fifth grade and I failed the sixth grade back to back in Texas. I'm from Texas. I got arrested for truancy, which just means that I'm a kid not in school. Right? right. They do that. Yeah, they simply do that in Texas. And I've spent literally five to 15 growing up in a trash can. And I want to put myself through school by forging my mom's signature because his food fed me twice a day. Mm -hmm. But at six years old, I had to figure out how to make a dollar just so I can eat. Right. And the reason I failed the fifth and sixth grade is when you start getting homework here in Texas and there was no lights and I have no running water, right? So I can't do any homework. I barely passed high school, barely. Uh, my high school graduated class was 772 people. I graduated 760. So I barely passed high school. Today I got a master's degree. But other than that, that's my origin story. And like you said, I'd never use anything as an excuse. I'm not even one of those people that offer excuses. I had to figure out how to make money at five and six. And now essentially that made me too smart to be broke when it comes to finance. Now, now you know something, Antonio, I don't know. You know, you say that almost casually, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I get it. You know, it's not something you're going to, you know, but I, I don't know if people really appreciate what you just said at five and six, you're right. out trying to make a buck so you can eat. 
and, 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 and you still had the wherewithal, even though you struggled, even mm. though you oh, struggled yeah. very easily, right? You still had the wherewithal to say, you know, I got to finish school too. You know, it's, yeah. and, and like you said, you weren't top of the class necessarily yeah. because you had no light. You had no, I, I'm assuming you barely had a place to sleep with a roof over your head. Yeah. I slept in a city dumpster. I slept in a city oh. dumpster on 40, 45th yeah. and like Winnie in Galveston, Texas. This is, this is, you know, I don't know if people appreciate that. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by that. <laughs> just, just that, appreciate because it. like, I have to tell you, my father, uh, growing up, I my father's an immigrant to this country, so I was the first right. generation born here, and he had to tell me stories about what it was like growing up under the fascist and Nazi occupation right. of his island in Greece. And he was like a young teenager, so he was like yeah. 12, 13, so he was, he was double your age at that point. <laughs> and I had to hear stories of him having to eat snakes, like yep. catch and kill snakes and, and uh, kill porcupines and skin yep. them for so his family would have a little bit of meat to eat and that sort of thing. And I was amazed by something like that from yep. my own father's story. And, and now I hear something like this from you where you're like, I'm five or six, I have no parents, I have no one to look after me literally have to fend for yourself the definition of fending for yourself Absolutely. and here you are you're you're a successful man obviously you work through these issues you worked hard and you still have a big bright smile on your face and you're able to and you're able <laughs> to walk around <laughs> and, and no man there's no such thing as smiling too much let me tell you that um and and you're hearing that from a new yorker who hates happy <laughs> people you know what yeah, i'm saying yeah, but your no. smile's a different smile you know what i mean brother it's like yeah. You're smiling. Your smile is one of confidence. Your smile oh, is yeah. one of being grateful for what you have. It's not, yeah. I don't get the impression that you're smiling to put one over on people. You know right. what I mean? You're right. smiling because I get the feeling that this, tell me if I'm wrong, man, because I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, you good. You, you said you have this genuine beaming smile because I get the feeling that you're, you're, you feel blessed in life that you feel life despite all the hardships you've had you're you're you can probably still turn around and say life is good man it is i, life I is do good. think it's good i do think it's good i'm glad you said that because i don't think life is about being happy so this is where i get real controversial right but this all is right. like so fitting for your podcast yeah yeah but, man. you know yeah you know and i was laughing on one of your episodes you were talking about you know you was new yorker liberal but you were weird because you were conservative and i you know I <laughs> yeah. about all this stuff I, I can relate the moment you get you think life is about being happy and then your your wife gets sick your grandmother dies you get cancer so and then why like life smacks you in the face it punches you in the face real right. hard i think life is about finding a problem that you love so much that you can't wait to get up in the morning and figure it out mm. That's more of my view. And I'm not telling you I'm right. I don't think anybody's right. I don't think anybody knows anything. What I am telling you, though, is that absolutely has a lot to do with my worldview. Mm. Because waking up hungry as hell every morning, hot, sweaty, the lovable problem I had to figure out was how the hell would I want to eat? Mm. This was a problem I had to fall in love with to, to, to live. As a matter of fact, I said this way, the man who falls in love with the destiny mm will will always oh the man who falls in love with the journey will always travel further than the man who falls in love with the destination i see what you're saying yeah right you know what i'm saying so that is why i'm happy because i just enjoy the journey it, it just is i shouldn't be here there's no way i walk in rooms i'm doing 33 million dollar deals deals with white men across the table and i'm a black man with dreads right. you know what i'm saying and <laughs> and and a lot of people in the room just had to walk a straight line for 85 percent I had to be homeless, get molested, get raped while being homeless, fail the fifth grade and the sixth grade and all sorts of stuff just to open the door to right. sit in that room. So that, that joy comes from that, man. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and I, you, there's a couple of things you said there that I find super interesting. So the first one is, I agree with you. I don't know that I would say I fall in love with a problem, but I am intrigued by issues. Like, right. I, you know, my, my wife always, you know, people ask her, what does your husband do for a living? And my journey has been crazy, man. I mean, I, I, I went to college, I got a degree in biology. Then I said, well, you know, then I got a degree in computer science. Mm -hmm. Then I said, you know, I like Wall Street. So I, I spent time on Wall Street learning how to trade and work with foreign currencies. Then I got into data analysis, you know, so my whole journey, people look at me and say, how many different You're things? You're a straight thinker. <laughs> yeah, but 
what I tell and what my people, I love my wife's description of me. She said, the people say, what does your husband do for a living? What does John do for a living? And she just goes, he counts things for people, which almost sounds simplistic. But when you think about it, everything I've done in life involves numbers. Wow. It involves having an equation, having a problem and saying, what's the answer here? And how does that answer yeah. help someone, right? So that's my journey. My journey is looking at numbers. And I'm not a math genius, by the way. But I just like looking at numbers, writing code, things like that. And it applies yeah. to just about everything in life. But that journey, I love what you said when you said you fall in love with a problem you, yeah. or, or you wake up saying, how am I going to fix this particular problem? Yeah. Right. And then once that problem is fixed, you move on to the next one. Right. right. I get, yeah. You get bored. <laughs> yeah. Now, the second thing, I am, it has to be addressed, man, because I was thinking that you said, here I am sitting across white men and here I am with people who haven't had the zig and the zag that I've had to go through life. They've had pretty much a, a smooth ride. Mm -hmm. um, by smooth, it doesn't mean they didn't work hard. It oh, just course, means course, they didn't have to over overcome necessarily uh, the, the issues you've had to overcome. Right. Right. So in your mind, in your heart, do you look at it and say, man, that's not fair. That's not fair. Why do these guys get a free ride? Or in the, in the alternate, I'll let, uh, let me throw it out there. You answer both any way you want. Have you felt resistance from not necessarily white men or white women or whatever from other people who have not been in your shoes saying like what does this guy really know you know like oh. uh, can i do a deal with this guy you know really because i yes. look at his history you know like i mean have you run into that if you have what does it do to you uh, talk to yeah. me about that okay i'm so excited about this question it has like three different answers for sure. one white people love me and this is here's here's the deal and this is not i'm not someone who chases there's a phrase out there, white trinkets. You understand? Mm. So this, I'm, I'm, I don't need rewards. I have my own economy. Right. As far as the question goes, when I say white people love me, it's because I'm not making excuses, mm. and I am not asking for anything. I am figuring out how things work, like the coding and the biology, and mm -hmm. and I, I started to get my doctors in mathematics. But by the time that I figured out I was going to go to university of Houston, I was a millionaire. So I was like, eh, I'm not going to school, right? <laughs> but <laughs> so that stopped me from going to get my doctor right. in mathematics. But the it's the opposite. I I never get resistance from people. Who, as a matter of fact, correction or or criticism never comes from people who make more money than you. Mm -hmm. Correction and criticism always comes from people who don't make more money than you. So typically, I hang around billionaires, so I'm in a room with billionaires, and then when you make more money than someone, you're happy to lift them up instead of the opposite of resistance. When I do get resistance, it comes, it's typically the, uh, the cognitive dissonance that's created from the age. Mm -hmm. Since I'm so young, there's a resistance of me being so smart or so well off at such a young age, I do feel that resistant. And if you don't mind me asking, how yeah. old are you, Antonio? I'm 41 now. I just turned 41. All right. Okay. Yeah, but I have i haven't had a job since I was 29. Yeah, you're I still became, a young man. Yeah, you still got your yeah. whole life ahead of you. Yeah, brother. and I became a millionaire somewhere like 35. So somewhere around there. Yeah, you know, right, say something right. like that. It was in 2016, so whatever the, the age difference is there. So I love that question. Here's the cool thing. We, I, I don't, I would never say I don't see white and black because I think when people say that, they're crazy, right. right? We all know there's one human race. Well, we don't all know that, but we should all know that. But, you know, besides that, there are different advantages and disadvantages. Me, it's the exact opposite. When I walk into a room when people had an easier path, I, it doesn't make me resistant. It doesn't make me jealous. It makes me feel like the most powerful person in the room. Mm, interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Maybe that's that entrepreneur spirit coming out. Or right. maybe through nature versus nurture that growing up homeless in a trash can, I have to have that. I have no idea what it is, but mm. I do know that every time I go somewhere, I'm always comfortable in my genius level. Mm. So you always meet me in what I'm good at and what I like doing. So I'm always happy for other people because when you're absolutely enthralled and, and, and enveloped in your own happiness. You don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. You yeah. Know what I'm <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's what I think about that. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've said it on a couple of other shows when I've had other guests who, who are of that mindset, which I find fabulous. When I was young on Wall Street, now, I think I, I mentioned earlier, I went into Wall Street as a scientist. I didn't go yeah. in as a money guy. You know, I went in as a biologist and as a computer scientist. And I'm like, okay, how does Wall Street work? Because I was getting married. I was engaged. I said, I, I need to earn some money. 
by bi- I respect biologists. They don't earn any money. They can't support a big family, right? I understand. So I went to Wall Street and I had this old uh this boss who's your stereotypical New York Jewish banker. The only reason I phrase it like awesome. that is because if I if I go into the caricature, everybody immediately knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. So I know this exactly guy who's a little about. bald on top, he's only got the horseshoe hair, and and he talks like he's from Brooklyn and he should be a rabbi, you know, and he talks like <laughs> yeah. that. And he took me under his wing. Now, he had no reason to take me under his wing because I was a newbie. I, 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 every question you could imagine, really, what's, what's a currency trade? What's spot mean? What's a future trade? You know, uh, what's the future valuation of money? What's MPV? Like, I didn't know any of that stuff going in. But for whatever reason, he, he took a shining to me. And when he was right. interviewing me, he said, I think I could, I could help this kid. And he always said to me, he goes, Professor, as you get old in life, you want to make sure that when you're a manager, you surround yourself with people who are much smarter than you right. that could show you something. The people who surround themselves with yes men, they fail, you know, All the time. and at the time I didn't realize I was too young. I was 25. I was too young even then to understand what that the power of what that meant. When I left him, when I went mm-hmm. to get another job and when I became manager and I had people of my own to, whose careers I was molding. Then it hit me. Right. Then it hit me. The wisdom of what he meant by that. Be the dumbest person in the room. Right. Be the stupidest person in the room. Not because you think you're stupid, but relatively speaking, surround yeah. yourself with people better than you. And that's like Absolutely. what you just said, right? Absolutely. When I'm surrounded by billionaires, there's no hate. There's no hate. There's no jealousy of those billionaires. Yeah. You're like, maybe I can learn from them. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. they can show me. I'm not smart enough to know everything. Like what was Socrates saying? Like he goes, all I know is that I don't know. Oh, I love that. Right. Yes, and it's, yes. it's like, you're taking that approach, man. And I love that approach in you. Uh, and that's why I said, when I read your bio, I got all excited, you know, I <laughs> to talk to you because like, man, you, you've overcome so much, but all right. So that's sort of like what you're building up. Now, the other thing I saw about you, you mentioned you got, was it a master's in math or a PhD? What did, what did you get? So I've, I, no, I've got, actually, my bachelor's is in Christianity. My minor is in biblical languages and my bachelor's master's is in theological uh, studies. So okay. I went the whole scholar, okay. Jewish, but uh, with a strong focus on Jewish covenants. Mm. So I, yeah, so Jewish covenants is okay. what I did there. And then I tried to flip and go to be a quantum physicist. And I want to University University of Houston wanted me to start from a bachelor's and go get to all the mathematics and stuff because I'm a nerd at heart. Mm-hmm. And then I became a millionaire and it was like, well, <laughs> I'm not going back to school, right? So all then, right, but you're mathematically oriented because absolutely, I, also, I, I see you keep mentioning something called the master algorithm. Yes, and, and, and you have a big interest in artificial intelligence, AI. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. Tell us, is that what your companies are involved in? Uh, absolutely what what do you mean by that give us give us sort of a breakdown i i'm very interested in finding out what you mean by a master algorithm and how that ties into ai and, and everything yeah absolutely so i'm a tech guy I, like you I, mm-hmm. I program i code i'm self-taught mm-hmm. and, and and pretty good at I, well i am pretty good at it because i'm compulsive anything i focus on i have to <laughs> right. kill i have to murder right, right anything right, i focus right. on exactly right? anything and so I, I do, I invent stuff. I'm preparing my company for the metaverse right now. I have built my own blockchain. It's it's pretty much done. I have my own social media. It's, I got to pull down right now. I, you know, all sorts of stuff. I just, my company looks more like Google. It's like Alphabet. That's what you call ATSJR. And then inside of that, it's like 27 different companies that are existing in my company just so you can get in for free. Well, that's really because I want your name, number, email address, physical address, zip code. I want all that stuff, right? You know, except you I don't data. sell I want all of it. But I don't sell data. I don't sell data, which makes sense for someone like me, because as a black person, technology puts you out of business. It puts you it, it mm. you know it, it totally marginalizes people of color even more. So there's no reason for someone like me knowing that to sell data because I would just be marginalizing. I would get control and right. then sell that control. Right. And, and and by marginalizing, uh, let me see if I understand why yeah. you should make that statement. Is it because you're saying it takes away unskilled jobs that statistically are usually occupied by absolutely. Color? Is absolutely. that what you mean by marginalizing? Absolutely. Because yeah. Technology is supposed to make us lazy. That's what it's supposed to do. As a matter of fact, there is no conflict between capitalism and technology. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. People 
whose jobs are going to get replaced are going to be people who are in unskilled jobs. Right. And that is mostly people of color for sure. Right. Okay. And so I, it's like a really, I would never be a real estate agent. I would never get control of an asset and then sell it to somebody else. Like, you know what I'm saying? Some of these things just make fiscal and financial sense. I would never do that. So I do a lot of things tech and I make all that money. And then what I do is I come back and I have a platform where I teach people most of about 95% for free, how to do what I just did, mm -hmm. how to build this blockchain, how to like today, if you look on my YouTube page, I did 81 classes so far since March of personal finances today. Wow. We, I just covered today how to remove inquiries from your credit report and how to get approved for any loan possible. The five things you're most certainly going to need yesterday. I was talking about how to run the numbers on an apartment on 30 unit apartment complex. Right. I'm, and I'm doing this for free. It, it costs no right. money whatsoever. So it's something that I love. It's something that I do. And here's the four missions of my company. We take, I only want 10% of this money. So 90% I'm giving back. I have four major missions of my company. One is to create 100,000 millionaires. I've created over 1,000 so far. Two is to make the people who can't sell top salespeople or income earners in their country. Three is to end a student loan debt crisis because that's just stupid. And four is to end world hunger. So I have lots of percentages allocated. Every time a dollar comes in, it goes to adopting children, paying off student loans and stuff like that. So that's where that $1.5 billion comes in at. It's tied into the growth of my company. And, and, and I like that you have a feedback loop built into that because Absolutely. what you're saying is you're being upfront. You're not saying, hey, I'm... Um, this 100% uh, uh, um, uh, philanthropist. You are a philanthropist They're under yeah. any definition of the word. I, I doubt anyone would, would categorize you otherwise. <laughs> what you said. Um, but you're also being upfront. You're saying, look, I'm keeping a percentage for myself. For I'm a my major effort. capitalist. <laughs> yeah, I'm a capitalist. I need to make a profit too, right? But, what, right. but I, what I also hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is I don't need that much. No. I've got enough to live on. I've got enough to be comfortable. I've got enough to do what it, it gives me pleasure, what gives Absolutely. me joy, gives me chance to pursue my my journey, as you mentioned earlier. Absolutely. But at the same time, I'm helping people. I'm teaching them how to pull them up the way I did. Right. To 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 to. Uh, I hate the phrase "fend nope. for themselves," but but, but they do need to fend for themselves. But they do need to fend <laughs> yeah. for themselves. And but you're showing them how to do it in a way that's intellectual, in the sense that they get to use this to pull their way out of right. it. Right? They don't have to necessarily grab a shovel or a pickaxe, um, or, or or say to yourself like get a minimum wage job. Even though right. you know there's nothing wrong with that. Um, nothing wrong at all. You got to start uh, you somewhere. Know, you got to start somewhere. Accumulate some capital and build that up, right? Yeah, your um, dad killed snakes, right? You yeah, start somewhere, you know. You got to start somewhere, you know. Somewhere. And and there's no shame in that. Like my nope. first job was a dishwasher, and typical for a Greek kid, my first job was washing dishes in a in a diner, you know, in New York City. That was my that was my first money that I could put in my pocket and say, I earned myself. I was 13 or 14 and, and, you know, off the books, nobody had to know about it. Um, that sort of thing. So, uh, okay. So, so I understand now how your companies, mm -hmm. you know, um, are working towards that goal of your creating a hundred thousand millionaires, um, right. and showing them how to earn that themselves. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you could come on one day, help me and my partner turn this into a. Oh uh, yeah, got gotcha. you. <laughs> you know, uh, we could uh, look. Uh, we could use people a lot smarter than myself, right? So, um, but at the same time, now talk to me specifically about the master algorithm oh, and the yes. AI that Nobody. you're interested in. Um, I had, for example, a couple episodes back, we had Matt Lobel, who's the creator of Playin, which is a blockchain technology uh, gaming environment, and. What, what fa fascinated me about that is he's using the blockchain. He's created his own uh, cryptocurrency right. for use within his world, right? The world <laughs> that he's creating for, for gamers. And uh, his social mission is that you, you play to earn, right? So right. by having this crypto tied exclusively to the universe that he's creating in the gaming world, as people power up, as they play more games, uh, by only using the crypto you were at and it's and it's a deflationary crypto right he's only right. making a certain amount of it it's not like uh like uh, uh, uh like um doge or shina ibu it's not right, you know right. there's not trillions of these things being made every day 
is like more like Bitcoin or gold, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's only publishing a fixed, I forget what the number is, a fixed number of these right. coins. So as people play and use them to acquire body armor or, or big, big effing gun, perfect, you know, perfect. Um, then those players can then turn around and say, uh, I'm selling my, uh, my crypto in this system for, I think he calls it GMG. Uh, I'm selling my GMG for the equivalent of a thousand dollars a coin. Right. Whereas when he got right. in, it was like 10 cents a coin. Right. So he's right. trying to build this this market. And I was fascinated by that because he's creating, in essence, an alternate universe. He's he's creating a world where people, anyone can yeah. get in early and it appeals to kids, to youngsters. It yep. appeals to people who might be disenfranchised, who can only wake up enough in the morning and turn on their Xbox or turn on their PC. And that's all they can do for whatever right. reason. And I found that I said, here's a guy who A, is a capitalist. He wants to get rich off of this. B, as part of his getting rich, he's going to bring people up with him. Yeah. And I found that fascinating uh, when I talked to him. And I get the sense, I get the sense that you're sort of in the same vein, right? Doing the same thing. <laughs> so I, how does, but, but not necessarily with games, right? So how does the master algorithm, how does your interest yep. in AI play into this? Yeah, it absolutely does. So the master algorithm I'm totally failing at. It's a lovable problem that I, I love to get up and fail every day. Nobody has solved the master algorithm. Think of it as Lord of Rings. And this is right in your computer science talk. The one ring to rule them all. Gotcha. So the one algorithm to rule them all. And there's a great book on this. I forgot the guy's name, but he's fantastic. And he wrote another book too. And he wrote Mass Algorithm like four or five years ago, maybe six years ago. And there's a there's a bunch of nerds like like us out there trying to figure this out. Maybe the end of the world, maybe the beginning of singularity. <laughs> Who knows, right? But you know, but doing that. My belief is so what artificial intelligence plays in my company this ease because since we in this social media ease type web 2.0 world, people like something for nothing. Mm-hmm. And since I can't change you about that, I'm just gonna sell it to you. You know, and then, you know, fix it a different way. So the artificial intelligence allows that and allows my stuff to get better. That's the answer to that question. What I'm trying to do with the master algorithm is be one of the first people to figure it out. Gotcha. Because <laughs> yeah. like, like I want, like if I owned Apple and I know Apple is doing this and I'm not confirmed with this, but I know they're doing it because I would be doing it. I would be first to self-driving cars because who's going to have a better self-driving car than Apple? But literally, I walk in the car and my phone sinks to my entire car, right? It's going to be incredible right. if they pull it off. The mass algorithm, I got, you, got the, you, got the, you got the neuroscience problem, obviously. How do I get this algorithm to think like a brain? Mm. And then how do I get this algorithm to evolve like a human, which is the hardest part. Okay, I can get it to think. Right. But how do I get the algorithm to fall like a baby? and never get mad at falling and eventually fall a thousand times until the baby starts walking. How do you, how do you get an algorithm to learn? Yes, absolutely. Right. Which is, which, that's why I keep stumbling at for sure. I keep stumbling right there. How do I get this algorithm to learn and then learn like a human? Because you know this, it'll take a supercomputer hundreds of thousands of lines of oh, code yeah. Yeah. just for a bird to land on a tree and decelerate, right? A oh. tree launch. So it's, it's incredible. And then, I got the whole physics problems. How does this algorithm exist in the world? How does this algorithm not kill us in the first place? Right? You know, and then if I write the three main rules or something like that, people say, how do how does the algorithm not reinterpret these rules as it does evolve and stuff? So it's fun. It's definitely fun. But I really am big into robotics. I do have a gaming company, but I've got my I've got uh, two boys and a little girl, and I have them. Like whatever they daddy do, they got to do. They can do whatever they want to do. But if I got to learn Hebrew, they got to learn Hebrew, right? If I have to learn Python, they got to learn Python. Gotcha. So we've been, we've been doing this stuff. And now the, these kids, they 13, 10, and 5, are building this stuff with me. And I'm grateful for that because they keep me hip mm. to the TikTok generation and the YouTube and things like that, right? Because at 41, I'm a little too old at this. So even though I'm a millennial, right. I'm still too old. So yeah, that's what I'm doing with all of that. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And you know, it's funny. Um, I was watching the Lex Friedman podcast. I don't know if you've ever gotten a chance to listen to him. And he's the head of the AI research, essentially, at MIT. Um, and when you 
listen to someone like him. His an almost entire life is singularly focused on that task. Yeah. I think the only time he comes up for air is to do his podcast. He has like <laughs> all these great guests. And to this day, I don't know how he gets all these great guests. But um, when he talks about, he he did an online course, uh, just one three-hour lecture, just an introduction wow. to AI that he gives his students at MIT. When people who think AI is around the corner and killer robots and the Terminators around the corner. No, 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 no. I, I remember when I was still a student, um, was trying to get a graduate degree. Uh, this was in the late eighties, even. Yeah. The, the problem was something as simple as how do you get eight parallel processors to work on a short piece of code, like a blackjack program, Yeah. how to play blackjack more like a human. Right. Yeah. And now, you know, so you start out by saying, okay, uh, you got all your rules that you write into it, right? The rules that anyone could read in a book, you know, you yeah. hit on this, you, you stand on that and you count cards, whatever. Do it in parallel. So it thinks as fast as a human. Hmm. Then figure out where the error was and yeah. which of the eight processors. Now people, for people that don't know, if your brain is one big processor, it's got millions and billions of tiny little nodes that all connect and fire yeah. at the same time and there's parts of our brains that do one that answer one part of a problem the, that work simultaneously with the other and if you try to map it out you go insane yeah and to your point even something as simple as a bird a hummingbird landing on a branch the deceleration the optical uh information going from the eye the the gravity the the wind the when, so when I see something like, say, Elon Musk's um, spaceships auto right. landing somewhere, I, 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 I'm, I'm blown away. Me too. I can't even begin to fathom how any human could even build the computers that figured that out. And, and they compete with governments. He's a <laughs> private human competing with governments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're right. Although I think the government <laughs> probably would end up screwing up. They have more money, more resources, no, no. but I think individuals are what drive us forward. Like I've Absolutely. never had my faith in institutions um, pushing society forward. Yeah. Well, that makes I, you a libertarian, I, right? Because you're I'm a libertarian. A libertarian yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. and, and like, uh, but even more so more than politically, I think when you, when people form groups, yep. then the group becomes more important than the person. I agree. Whereas if the person's working on a problem, they have right. their own motivations. They don't have to worry about it. Like for you, your motivation was when you were a kid, I got to eat. My motivation may have been, I want to win an award. Right. Somebody else's motivation might've been, I want to be a millionaire. Yep. And when you, if you put the three of us in a group, whose, whose motivation comes out first? Wow. What do we, you know, like to me, that's, that's why groups always keep society straight, <laughs> meaning yeah. that it keeps, it manages the status quo. Yeah. But it takes all the disenfranchised people that you mentioned. Absolutely. It takes all the people that society is slowly leaving behind. Yep. Um, what do we do with those folks? Yeah. What do we do with those folks? Like, are we, are we prepared to say, let them die? Are we prepared to say, who cares what happens to them? No. Even, even a libertarian, even an yeah. anarchist, I think, would never propose that. You'd have to be a psychopath to propose that. Yeah. But functionally, is that what happens? And I always wonder about that. Um, I know you've got your divinity studies that you may have I, but I'm not religious at all, though. I'm right. Not religious at all. Yeah. Well, that's why I said divinity studies. Right. Yeah, because I think exactly. a lot of it when you I, it, again, you please feel free to talk about this. But yeah. um, those studies, like if you listen to Jordan Peterson, for example, he always that's claims that those Jesus. religious slash biblical slash Talmudic uh, mm. or um, Quran or, or, or the Tao, whatever. Yeah. Um these are our first hierarchies. These are our first moral constructs as a human race, whether you believe that they were from a divine source or from a human source or just written up, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the fact is true. that a lot of society and morality is based on those things, right? Oh, yeah, so when someone studies them as you have, I'm sure that you get insights that re religious faith aside, right? you can start to see how that relates to society, right? Absolutely. So, you know, and, and, how does that affect you, by the way? Why don't you answer? Yeah. Me yeah. Ask, how does that affect I, you in your day to day? I agree with you 100 percent. Right. I'm nonpartisan, so I'm not I'm not left or right. I'm not Democrat or Republican. I'm not libertarian. I have a lot of libertarian in me because I'm a free thinker. Mm -hmm. So I'll shift. So when it comes to 
I believe, right, let's just take Christianity for a little bit and I'll just have people throw stones at me right after this. <laughs> it's fantastic until you organize it. Mm-hmm. Like the worst thing that ever happened to Christianity was to not see in council and organizing Christianity. It was a purposeful gathering of people, ecclesias, the Greek word there. The moment you put a hierarchy on it, it no longer becomes that. So you lose the light and now you diminish that. And for for Kirche, this German word that means to build in, mm-hmm. and you know, you go for that. And that's the that same concept applies for anything you organize. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. The moment, like, you, you know, college and university are going through this very same thing right now. The right. idea actually comes from the church that they saw everybody building guilds everywhere and then the church started what we would, what we would call colleges now but now they're no longer giving anybody a return on their investment whatsoever in the 21st century because it's been organized so much it's about the endowment mm. and not the return or not the impact on the community, right? And it's things like that. We've got colleges with with endowments greater than countries' GDPs. Yes. <laughs> and that's what yes. it's about. Yeah. So how it affects me on a daily basis is as a free thinker, I'm always looking at how we 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 do things. And the the number one thing I can gather from what you just said is tell the truth and don't lie. Mm. When we get into organizations, we typically, if we can't tell the truth, at least not lie. But what we do is we start bending and twisting this truth to the benefit of my title or mm. my 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 command or my prestige. And the truth stops being about sharing abundance and it starts being more about protecting my abundance. So now, as a reap what you sow, universe, law of attraction, I don't care what you call it. But nobody ever gets away with anything. And we know this. We like through human experience, at some point it will catch back up. So I can build a political life. This is why I don't really, uh, I'm not partisan. Well, I'm not partisan for multiple reasons, but mainly politicians don't solve anything. Mm. That's that's an engineer's job. That's a technician's job. Like, you know, your kid, when you was in Wall Street, you didn't say, oh, let me get a politician. No, <laughs> you got the Jewish mentor, right? You, right, <laughs> you right, know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, well, right. It's time for you to write lines of code. You don't ask your congressman. You write lines of code and you struggle with that code. You find out that error. You, you hit command, refresh, right. and you refresh it, blah, blah, blah. Right. On a daily basis, this idea of organizing things couldn't be more true when you said that keeps society straight, but we're not here to keep society straight. We're here to bend the rules. Mm. We're here to know that the things that are built in front of me, and Steve Jobs said this, are made by people no smarter than me. I don't want to get up and go to bed and pay my taxes and die. I want to bend the rules. I want to break things. I want to genuinely invent something new that nobody else invented because I'm an individual. And when you have that group thing going on, you mm. lose that individualism and you lose this 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 entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. And and everything you've said, I agree with. And what's interesting, I'm a good libertarian. I'm a good I, libertarian. You, you would be. You would be. I, I think from especially from the free thought perspective, Absolutely. you're very much, I would say, you fall in line with a lot of libertarian ideas. Absolutely, I do. Um, what's interesting to me, though, as you were talking. Uh, and I say this to a lot of my guests because I, I I find that I've been interviewing people of like mind recently a lot. Um, all I could think of is the normal distribution curve in my head. And wow. as you were talking about awesome. it, you know, and uh, for those, again, that don't know, the normal distribution is a st- statistical model that seems to apply to any human population or or biological population, be it uh, bacteria, trees, livestock, humans, it doesn't matter. A normal distribution is what a lot of people refer to as the bell curve. And um, it really is a distribution of of, uh, averages and uh, standard deviations, basically. What Antonio just described, folks, (laughs) is what's called the right tail of the distribution, which is, what is it, Antonio? Two or three standard deviations from the average. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at it on the positive side of whatever trait you're looking at, Those are where your geniuses are. That's where the people who bring society along are. Like, so if if the average is here, you go one standard deviation, it goes down a little bit. 
You go two standard deviations, it goes down a bit. You go three standard deviations, it's almost at zero yep. because there's only a handful of people. And those are like the Elon Musks of the world, yep. the Steve Jobs that you mentioned. And it doesn't matter what field you're in. It could be doctors. It could be engineers, mathematicians, actors, musicians, like, musicians like Daniel Day-Lewis, Bob Dylan. They're at that right yep. end of that tail right now. Mm -hmm. The, the downside of that distribution is <laughs> on the left side of the tail, the negative side, that's where you get your psychopaths. Yep. That's where you get your killers. That's where you get the people who are out to destroy society, but not in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like your, uh, your Mao Zedongs, your Stalins, your Hitlers, right? They're all coming from that end of it. Doesn't mean they're stupid. No, they're they, mean, they can be extremely intelligent, but they've got some sort of psychopathy that puts them in that, yeah. <laughs> in that end, right? So to what you were saying, the bell curve, the hump of the curve, and even a little bit to either side of it, those mm -hmm. are the people that keep the ship going straight. They're the ones that prevent the people on the left end from killing us. Yep. And it's preventing the people on the right who always want to blow stuff up. Yeah. But sometimes they're wrong. And not because they're evil, <laughs> but because they're wrong. They made a mistake. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. just like, look, you and I are coders. I doubt we've ever written any significant code that worked on the first go round. I've never, <laughs> right? ever. <laughs> right? You always have to say, Oh, here's an error on line 2050. Yeah. Oh, let me go yeah. back and check that. You know? So, so I understand when people are either conservative, they say they're conservative or they're just, oh, I'm just, I'm apolitical. I just want to live my life and, and, and provide for my family or whatever. I get those people. I have no yeah. ill will, but that's not how we go forward. Nope. We go forward or backwards, depending on which end of those tail distributions are Absolutely. currently running things, right? Now, as optimists, as as whether you call us libertarians or religious people or whatever, um, we're hoping that it's the people at the right end of the tail that are leading us, right? Because right. We'll, we'll follow eventually, right? The things that were crazy in the 60s scientifically are commonplace yep. now. That's right. Like if someone told you you could have this little thing like this little thing in your pocket yep. and you could communicate with just about anybody in the world. It would do things like take your heart rate. It would uh, answer questions at any time, at any time. <laughs> and it had its own power source. You, it didn't have to be plugged in the whole time. You'd say, what am I watching a tricorder on Star yeah. Trek? Am I watching Captain Kirk be, be me up That's Scotty? Right. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. We are but think about future. that. In the '60s, when we saw it on Star Trek, we go, "That's science fiction. That's crazy, yeah. man. We'll Absolutely. never live to see that." Guess what? You and I, or me especially, because I'm 20 years older than you. Old <laughs> but man, I'm actually living the science fiction that I saw as a kid. That's right. That's right. You will see something that I'll probably won't live to see. I've Your never kid. known a world without a computer. Exactly. <laughs> see, there you go. And. Your kids will grow up probably with people living on Mars. Yeah. With people trying to get to Pluto. With with literally the human yeah. race expanding off this this planet we're stuck That's on right now. Right. So now, awesome. when you think of that, it blows my mind, man. It, yeah. It blows my mind. So awesome. Your kid might be one of the guys who or gals that solves the problem of how to build the colony on Mars. That's right. Think about that, man. Yeah. It's now incredible. when you think of that. And then you have to deal with people who don't want that, who, who just say, leave me alone. I don't want you pushing the envelope. That's a little weird to me. And I've never understood why, if you choose to live your life like that, and maybe that's why I'm a libertarian. But if, you, <laughs> if you want to live your life like that, go ahead and live your life like that. I got no problem. Be happy. Why are yeah. you trying to prevent other people from living their lives like that? And, and man, I know you've, I could tell from your personality, you've got like this upbeat personality. I could tell. Yeah. I'm uh, pretty positive. You're an optimist. <laughs> you're, positive, you're positive. You've got that. Like I said, you've got that great heartwarming smile. It's not a fake smile. I could tell, man, you're happy Jeez, to thanks. be here. You're I happy. Am. You, you have a positive outlook on the future yeah. for the world, not a negative one. Yeah. Um, so when you're putting this together, it sounds to me like you're almost less the guy that wants that necessarily expects to come up with this master algorithm as much as you want to be the guy who planted the seeds and That's fertilized right. the soil and watered the mines that are going to come up with that master algorithm. Maybe after you've left this earth, 
you are and they'll be the ones who are going to come <laughs> up and say i got it i yeah. got it and i got it in part because ats junior companies That's gave right. me the opportunity to either go to school or buy a computer That's right or or something to that effect am i getting that right that you are very perceptive absolutely absolutely you got that right and it, it's it's now i'm weird because i as a free thinker I'm, I'm i'm a fan of reincarnation so i think about incarnations birth as these these moments in which you do something whatever the hell you want to do that's up to you so when i when you roll with that thinking i came here to lay the foundation for as many people as possible i feel and that's, you, you know what i'm saying yeah and that's yeah. the way i share my light and, and so I, I I just fundamentally believe abundance is meant to be shared. And it's not a belief. It's a it's an observation. It is a conscious observation by a conscious observer. If you have an orange tree and the orange tree has oranges on it and you try to eat all the oranges so you don't share it, you're going to die of orange toxicity, which is a real thing. So you can't do that. If you have the orange tree and you create immigration laws for nobody to get to the orange tree, what's going to happen is the orange is going to second th second law of thermodynamics is going to take over from order to disorder, entropy. So the orange tree is going to go from order to disorder, go back into the ground in which it came from because you, with your little selfish butt, did not want to share the oranges. So the only logical thing you can do with the orange tree is take your share and then share it with others so that one orange tree become millions of orange trees across the planet. Right. That is the, that's not just new age thinking. That's not wooey fooey talk. That's not optimism. That's an exact observation of how nature works. And when we don't do that, well, we have serious problems. And to your point, I was thinking about, so Chinese have a, like with my kids, see my kids never known a world without a smartphone. Smartphone mm. came out in 2008. They, my oldest is born in Halloween 2008. So he's never known a world without a smartphone. And the other ones behind them never known a world without anything of a smart device or something mm. like that. The Chinese have this idea that says, uh, I'm a little rusty on my Mandarin, but it's Fubo Goi Sandai. And it means wealth does not pass to the third generation. Mm. So when you were talking about going to Mars, my bleeding liberal heart now, so I went from libertarian to liberal heart was like, wait, we got to make sure that this makes sense for the third generation because typically like your dad suffered so you don't have to right. one generation. And then your kids are going to appreciate that. But by the time their kids come, they don't have that hustle that no. your dad had right. or you had. And so wealth does not last a third generation. And I was thinking about that when you were talking, like, man, it would be so amazing. And then my, my left scared brain went, holy crap, but we're going to lose <laughs> it when they get to Mars. <laughs> yeah, well, so you, know, about that. I, I, you know, I hear what you're saying because I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an optimist, maybe not as much as you, but I am of the belief that that life is getting better for everybody. Even the, poor, the poorest person in the world today is better off than most of the people, 95% of the people were 50 years ago or 100 Even years kings, ago. Kings, kings in right. the antiquity and in, in Hebrew times, kings. You know? yeah. 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 So I believe that. I believe life is getting better for more people. But at the same time, certain aspects of our lives are lost to us. Oh, absolutely. So if you went without power for three days, let's say the electric grid failed for three days here in the yeah. U.S., how many of us could survive? How many of us could get our food? How many of us yep. would know, would be prepared? To, like there was this great show that said, do you know how long it would take to make a sandwich a mm. hundred years ago? Meaning that someone had to uh, plant wheat, had wow. to cull the wheat, had wow. to grind it. Then they had to make, uh, they had to have the water to make the flour. Then you had to bake the bread. Then you That's had to amazing. make sure the bread didn't get moldy. Then you had to have some meat. That's then amazing. you had to have a chicken laying around that you grew in a coop. So that one sandwich, when you added up all the effort, might have taken you almost two and a half years to make one sandwich. That's incredible. Think yeah. about that. And now, other than me going to the grocery, getting a loaf of bread, getting a half pound of turkey from the deli or whatever, That's how incredible. am I making a sandwich? 
You know what I'm saying? My life is great in other yeah. ways, right? I'm living longer than my father did. Yep. He lived longer than his father did, right? We're enjoying yep. life. More of us are enjoying our children and our grandchildren, if that's what we decide to do. But can we make a sandwich? Can we start yeah. a fire? Like yep. I, I was in the Boy Scouts. My father made sure I knew how to start a fire without a match yep. or gasoline or anything. My kid doesn't know how to do that. Yep. Most kids don't know how to do that. Not that it makes me special, but yeah, no. uh, pull up something called McGuffey's Readers. I was talking to a friend <laughs> about this. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. McGuffey's Readers were the textbooks in the Little House on the Prairie days. If you think of that show wow. where you had like all the different classes in one yep. building, right? They were sitting in the same class. So the teacher had to teach to the same kids. The youngest might have been seven. The oldest might have been 20, but they were getting same. the same lessons. So how do you do that? They were right. something called the McGuffey readers. These were used for pe for kids from say first grade to eighth grade. I challenge university students today to read a McGuff to take a McGuffey reader and see if they can answer half the questions in that. <laughs> the answer is no. I've tried. No. I consider myself an educated man. Yeah. I could I can't get through a McGuffey's reader. But that was grade school textbooks right. in the mid eighteen hundreds. So. On some level, yeah, we're going to Mars. We're yeah. going to rockets. We yeah. got smartphones. We're building AI. We're going to have robots cleaning our house and serving yeah. us dinner. I get that. But we can't finish a textbook from the 1800s. Right. Right. And I'm not talking about stuff like who's the king of Lithuania. I'm not even talking about stuff that was contemporary. I'm yeah. talking about basic math. No, they knew all the principles of Aristotle. They knew the principles of Da Vinci. They knew the principles of Copernicus. Yep. They could use um, a compass. Yeah. They could use uh, yeah. a, a slide rule or yeah. whatever. You, you brought up Plato's five dialogues earlier. <laughs> I heard it. I didn't say that then, but I, I, I'm sure the yeah. people today wouldn't know that you brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. So to your, to your point, I do worry about that aspect of it. Yeah. And I understand that Chinese uh, proverb that you kind of are saying mm -hmm. that you kind of related, which I had never heard of, by the way. <laughs> it's another piece to add in here. Uh, <laughs> that generation ha doesn't go more than, uh, a wealth doesn't go more than three generations before you yeah. lose it. But that's that's fabulous. But you know, probably what does go more than three generations, I think are principles. And Absolutely. maybe that's a distinction, right? That the yeah, principle of distinction. learning a love of learning. I look at you, man. You you always have a love of learning. Yeah. It seems to me like your journey always includes learning. Like I, said, I loved it. I, I want to solve a problem, brother. Right. Yeah. So so you've got that journey, and I think if we put that in our kids, if we put that in the younger generations, and teach them the value of saying, "Look, man, I don't care what you learn, but just be in love with learning. That's it fine. doesn't even have to be reading." I I, can, I tell people today, if I was coming up today as a teenager, I'd never go to college. Yep. I'd spend all day on YouTube. Like yep. I started learning about quantum physics, much like yourself by watching YouTube. <laughs> yep. Like I didn't know what the double slit experiment was. I sat and watched it. I learned about Love it. it. Right. Love and, it. and then yep. I understand why we can't observe things. Neil wow. deGrasse Tyson came on. He was being interviewed and he said, you know why we can't tell? Cause the photons are bigger than the particles we're looking at. So yeah, you can, <laughs> it makes sense, you know, cause yep. you know, they're small, you know, so you know, or wave theories, function theories, uh, the collapse right. of these things. I, I'm not pretending to be smart enough to to do them from scratch, right? But were I a teenager now, I'd be glued on YouTube Absolutely. literally 20 hours a day going through these intellectual holes Absolutely. Um, and, and and figuring it out. So it's, it's the love of learning. The tool for learning changes. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. the way of looking at it. Whether yeah, it's, it's just a better way to live for sure. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, All right. yeah that, that could be passed down. Yeah. So Antonio, yes, uh, we're coming toward the end, but I always do this to my guests. So I'm going oh, to you right now to the end. Oh, yeah, man, man well, this is so fun. Okay, yeah, we okay. can, we'll have to. Hey, man, we're going to have another show with you on. We'll have you on again. But right now, let's ask some silly questions okay. uh, like we always do. When you're trying to unwind, what's your favorite activity? Beer. Beer. You just like having a nice cold <laughs> beer. Just give me a beer by video game. <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, what kind of beer? Imported or uh, uh, domestic? I like, I like imported. I like Mexican beer or dark lager. Doesn't like matter. A dark lager. A okay. dark lager is my favorite. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, when you're chilling with your dark lager, what's playing on the stereo? 
quantum physics podcast. There you go. Okay. No music, yeah. just podcast. There you no go. No music. Yeah. Quantum, quantum phys- physics okay. podcast. That's cool, man. That's that's how you unwind. Is there a that's movie it. or a TV series you enjoy? The Matrix and Harry Potter. I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. Huge. There you go. There you go. Yes. And then because this is sportsgrowlings.com, any favorite sports? <laughs> Football is where I grew up at. Indianapolis Colts is my favorite team. And then anywhere LeBron James goes, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> you like, you like, you, you like uh, the Colts? And, I love the and, Colts. And, and, even coming from Texas, you like the Colts. So it was Jim Harbaugh who made me a fan there and the go. Colts. And that's when he played happened. quarterback for yeah, them, right? Yes, absolutely. And then this little crazy guy, they paid man, was coming out of Tennessee and then it <laughs> fell there. And then I'm stuck ever since. <laughs> Sounds cool. I'm surprised. No Texas Longhorns in that. No nope. Aggies, no nope. Cougars, nothing, right? Nope. No Lionel. Not a college fan. Pro Not game. a college. Yep. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So, Antonio, thank you very much for joining us, thank man. You so much, I, I really appreciated this conversation. Uh, it was uplifting, to say the least. I love your awesome. attitude, I love your backstory. And uh, please come on again in the near future. Yes, We're going to reach out to you. We'll talk. We'll find out how your progress is going with the master algorithm. If you come up with anything new, you'll give me an update on how many new millionaires you've created. Right? Yes, We're up to yes, about a I thousand, will. Right? You said you created about a thousand right now? Yeah, it's a little bit over a thousand. All right. Maybe you add me to that list. Maybe I it sure becomes a thousand and one <laughs> with Big John being That's part of that it. list of millionaires. All right, everybody. Listen. Thank you. Brother. I hope you've enjoyed the show with Mr. Antonio T. Smith Jr. Certainly one of the happiest, brightest people <laughs> and most optimistic people I've interviewed to date. I hope everyone's enjoyed the podcast with Antonio. Join us again next episode when I'll have yet another interesting person we'll have a conversation with. Until that time, everyone, peace and love. See you next time. 